Good to see all of you. And uh, for those joining us online, we're glad you're with us as well. Make sure you get to know your host there. And so we're excited because uh, my name is Brian. I'm the Next Steps pastor here at Pathway. In fact, that's my first time announcing that new role. Uh, I've transitioned out of small groups now into this. And we know that if you've been here for 16 years or maybe this is your very first weekend, we know that as adults, we have next steps that we're all walking out and in your discipleship and getting connected and serving and, and all the collisions and all the intersections of what God is doing in your life, you have next steps and we want to serve you in that. And so I'm honored to, to do all that I can to kind of move into this new territory for us and help our church walk in a more holistic way of how we help adults take next steps. And so we'll be talking more about that as time goes by. And in the life of a church, this is a, a great time. We go, we go into seasons where things get really exciting. And right now we're in that season because two weeks from today is our annual outdoor baptism. And it's a time when we see the most people baptized. We have a picnic, you know, we gotta have food because we're outside, we're enjoying the weather. And we get to see the stories of what God is doing in lives of people all around here and students and adults. And so maybe you're on the fence and you're wondering, is this the time? Am I ready to do this thing? I hope you are because you can go online, you can use your connection card there in your seat or the seat next to you. You can go out to guest services, use our PCC at home app, click on baptism and you can sign up all those ways. Let us know that you're interested and then we're going to start a conversation with you about baptism. And that's coming up two weeks from today. I met a young lady last night and she was very nervous. I could tell about baptism and, and she said, is it okay if my husband comes in with me? I said, absolutely. Yes. Bring somebody with you. And so if you're on the fence because you don't want to do this thing alone, there's a lot of people looking at you, bring somebody with you with you. They need to be a part of your journey because it's great as a pastor to be in that moment with people as I baptize them, but I'm not going to be there, you know, at Thursday night, you know, when they just need to talk to somebody because I didn't give them my cell phone number when we were baptizing, right? So, but that's you. Or maybe that's a friend of yours. Make sure that you make somebody available or bring somebody along and, and be a part of that journey because that's what this is all about. We're here for one another. So baptism's coming up. Then next weekend at the 11 o'clock service, we are starting something brand new. And really, honestly, at Pathway, it's kind of hard to say. We got something brand new starting, but this is brand new. Our venue is taking on a whole new shape, a whole new kind of... Um, kind of feel about it because of our brand new space. And so next Sunday at the 11 o'clock, we're looking for individuals to step into kind of a kind of a stakeholder position, right? From the very beginning, bringing your heart, your experience, your influence, bringing your eyes. And so maybe you're a member and you've been here a long time and you just want to be a part of something fresh and new. This is a great time. Maybe you've just been attending. Maybe you're brand new and this is your very first weekend. You're like, I just want to be a part of something where people are still getting to know each other. Be a part of this next weekend, this venue space at at the 11 o'clock. We are growing and we know that God is sending more people and we want to be ready to receive them and lead them well. So just make sure, uh, go on your PCC at home app. You can click on the venue, enter in your email. That lets Eric know that you're coming and we're ready for you. Maybe you can't come, but you want to commit to this or get more information. Fill that out, get us your email and we'll send you some information and you can know more about that. All right, later in this service, at the end of this service, we're going to be receiving communion. So I hope you use this time to kind of prepare your heart, quiet off from the week, and, and get ready for this. So I'm going to invite you to stand where you're at because we are going to worship. That's why we're here. We're here because of our risen Savior. And I hope you use this time to get ready for what God has for you in this service. Let's worship.
Amen. As we continue to sing this morning, I want to read for us out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And it says, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed at the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. For those that follow Christ, part of our commission is to become more like Him. And we believe that worship is transformational. And our hope is that as we gather and as we sing these truths about Jesus, as we sing some of the attributes of our God, that it would infuse with our humanity and transform us. There's a quote from N.T. Wright that I really like that it says, you become like what you worship. When you gaze in awe, admiration, and wonder at something or someone, you begin to take on something of the character of the object of your worship. So let's sing and let us continue to be transformed into his likeness.
is tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. We know that you are here to meet us, Lord. We know that you are in our presence, Lord, that we are in yours. We call on your name, Lord, because there is power and there is healing in your name, Lord. I pray, Lord, that this morning we would be transformed, that we would be made more into your likeness, Lord. We pray that you move through this service, Lord. We pray that you give powerful words of wisdom to us from Tyler this morning, Lord that you help us to reflect on who you are and who you want us to be as we're able to remember and take communion together as a body. We give you this service, Lord. We love you and we thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. And everybody said, amen. Well, from the message from last week, Brent challenged us to turn and meet someone that's around you. So let's take a minute and actually turn and meet someone around you before you have a seat. There's going to come a point when that's a dangerous request to turn for a minute because it's going to go like 10 minutes and then an hour and then we're just going to have a big conversation and that's great. All right, so uh, we're going to continue in our service and we do this every week. I'm going to invite those that are serving us to come forward because we're going to receive an offering. It's a moment for us to pause and to remember that God is our provider and what we have, every good thing that we have is from him. And this is a chance for us to be reminded that our generosity, it comes out of the things that we hold dear to us, our valuable things. And when we hold things tightly, when we wrap our arms and our hands around things and we don't let go, God, you know, he responds to that, but not always in the way that we would want him to. And so we got to hold ourselves, our most valuable things with an open hand. I hope this time every week is a reminder that we've got to be generous people. And so uh, we're going to pass these buckets and as they go by, make sure they get all the way to the edges of the room. And then somebody from our team will come by and pick those up. Get your Bibles, get your sermon notes ready or your phones, your smartphones, and get your Bible app out. And uh, we're going to continue on with this conversation in just Jesus as we check this out. Good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you. Excited to be with you today and as always honored to be able to share with you, with those of you joining us online as well. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I want to invite you to take that out and turn in that with me to a book we find in our Bibles called John. Uh, It was a book written, surprisingly enough, by a guy named John. Very good. And, uh, And he wrote this book. He was one of Jesus' closest friends and followers. He wrote this book to help us understand who Jesus was and all that Jesus has done for us. So we're going to be looking there in chapter 3 of his book that he wrote for us and uh, looking at a story of a conversation Jesus had one evening with a guy by the name of Nicodemus. We're going to get into that here in just a moment. Before we dive into that, I want to recap for you uh, where we've been so far in this series that we've called Just Jesus. And if you were here early on uh, in that series several weeks ago, you know that we spent several weeks together focusing on a teaching that Jesus gave us that really focuses on our hearts and the kind of people that he wants to grow us into and then how that actually leads to what we started to talk about last week then, that not only does Jesus want to accomplish a certain amount of work in us, but then it also grows and matures to become work that he does through us in the lives of people all around us. And one of the ways that that happens is this, that we believe that 2,000 years ago that Jesus came into the world with a message. And as Brent talked about last week, it was a message of grace and truth. It's a message of hope and healing. It's a message of rescue and restoration, and as Jesus moved into the neighborhood, as we talked about last week, Jesus 
embodied it. He demonstrated, he showed what it looks like, this message that he came to bring. He lived it out in all sorts of practical ways. And then eventually in his story, he went and he died on the cross for all of us. And he rose again to bring this message to life for all of us. And as we continue to read his story, uh, we see that Jesus, before he, after he had finished that work and he had died on the cross and rose again from the dead before he ascended back into heaven, it says that Jesus actually did almost something somewhat unthinkable. He actually entrusted the message to us as his people. And he commissioned us to share this message that Jesus brought into the world. This is the mission that we as the church, that we as his people have been given. And so I want to begin there with you this morning. I just want to summarize this mission that he's given to us uh, in this way. You can fill this in in the notes that you're given as you came in today. But we want to just start here for a moment with this reality, with this truth that Jesus gave us a message to give to the world. Which is a pretty big deal when you think about it. It's a pretty big responsibility that Jesus has given to us. Jesus gave us a message to give to the world. And as I've thought about that in my own life, the responsibility of that for myself and also for others around me, one of the questions that's come to my mind from time to time as it relates to this is that if that's true, if we believe that, if Jesus gave us a message to give to the world, and the question I ask sometimes is, then why do we so often keep it to ourselves? And why do we so often not do the thing that Jesus actually gave us this message with to do? And as I've thought about that, there's probably a lot of different answers we could give to that question. But one of the answers that's come back over and over again for me is this, that even if we believe this, even if we know this, even if we believe that Jesus gave us a message to give to the world, even if we want to say something, even if we feel like, man, we really should say something, I think the thing that keeps many of us many, of the time, many times from doing from actually doing that is that we're not exactly sure what to say. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that in your life before. I know I find myself there every once in a while, maybe hard to believe when you hear me blab on uh, in, a, in a message like this, but sometimes you have opportunities in life, right? Where you have an opportunity to say something to somebody, you want to say something, you feel like you should say something, but you're not always sure what to say. One of the scenarios where I run into this, not very often, but every once in a while where I find myself faced with this, is moments in life when you run into somebody famous or you meet some kind of celebrity, right? And you see them and you wanna say something, you feel like you should say something, but you're not always sure what to say. Several summers ago, we actually, our family, for some strange reason, had a stretch of several weeks where we did a lot of different things as part of our summer vacation. We went to a lot of different places and everywhere we went, we seemed to run into somebody famous or some kind of celebrity. One of them was here in our own town, actually. Natalie and I went one night to see one of our favorite comedians, a guy by the name of Jim Gaffigan. And uh, some of you may know him or you fans of his, but uh, he was here in town at the Coliseum. And we went to his show that night. And then afterward, we went with some of our friends who were there as well to get some dessert afterward. And uh, we were at a restaurant. There's hardly anybody there in the restaurant with us. So we're eating our dessert and our waitress comes up and says, hey, do you guys know who Jim Gaffigan is? We said, yeah, we just were at his show. He's awesome. And, uh, and she said, well, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but, but he and his wife are sitting right over there. And we're like, man, this is a cool opportunity. We looked over, we could see them there and we felt like we wanted to say something, right? We felt like we, we should say something, but what do you say? And in those moments, you don't wanna be lame. You don't wanna mess it up. You don't wanna embarrass yourself. And uh, yeah, we braved it anyways. We went and introduced ourselves. And here's a picture of us with Jim, I think there with our friends uh, at the restaurant that night. But those moments when you wanna say something, you feel like you should say something, but aren't always sure what to say. When I thought of this, I also thought of one of my favorite Saturday Night Live skits from years ago now, and it uh, makes me feel older than I feel like I actually am, but it was the Chris Farley show. And if you remember that, Chris Farley would interview celebrities and different people, and uh, in his interview, you know, he wanted to say something, he felt like he should say something, but didn't always know what to say. And some of you maybe remember that. If you don't remember that, or if you've never seen it, no worries, I've got a clip of it right here. So let's check it out. Wait, hey. You remember when you were with the Beatles and you were supposed to be dead and uh, there's all these clues that like uh, he'd play some song backwards and it'd say like Paul is dead and uh, everyone thought that you were dead or something. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was um, a hoax, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I wasn't really dead. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, you, you remember um, Beatlemania? <laughs> Where those four guys, they dressed, uh, I went on stage and they looked like you and 
and then they played Beatles songs and and yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> So for those of you too young to know who he was interviewing there, that guy's name is Paul McCartney. He was part of this band called The Beatles, and they were really good. And so, but uh, I share that with you first because it's hilarious. But second, because more importantly, because I think many times, uh, if we're not careful as followers of Jesus, we can show up in the world in a very similar way. And we have opportunities to share this message that Jesus has given us to give to the world. We want to say something. We feel like we should say something. And yet sometimes, just like we just saw, we're not always exactly sure what to say, right? And this is why I think this conversation we're looking at together today in John chapter 3 is so helpful and so important for us. Because in this conversation Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus, I think he captures for us really the essence of the message that Jesus gave us to give to the world. And so I want to look at this with you. Again, if you have a Bible or something on your mobile device that you can follow along with, I encourage you to do that. We'll have the words up here on the screen. You can follow along there as well. But let me read for you what we find in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Here's what it says there, starting in verse 1. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. Now this word Pharisee, I want to explain that for you quickly. This was a, a particular group of Jewish people that uh, they had kind of their own way of doing things. Uh, the name Pharisee itself literally means separate, and they prided themselves on being separate unto God and separate from the evil world around them. And so one of the things that they did is they worked really hard to find all the rules in the Bible, and then they made up dozens to hundreds of additional rules about the rules that you find in the Bible so they can make sure they kept them to the letter of the law. And they worked very hard. That was the way that they thought they would make God happy, by keeping all the rules and keeping away from others who didn't keep all the rules. So this was Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council and he came to Jesus one night and he said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, and essentially says, I have some questions for you. He says, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God for no one could perform the signs that you're doing, Jesus, if God were not with him. And Jesus replied to Nicodemus, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. I almost imagine, I don't know this for sure, but I almost imagine Nicodemus thinking, wow, Jesus really dove right in there, right? I mean, I just tried to compliment you, get things started. You just jump right into the conversation with that. But now I'm curious, Jesus, and a little bit confused. He says, well, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born. Again, then Jesus explains that there's some mystery to this. He says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Doesn't seem like it's helping so much yet because Nicodemus says, well, how can this be? And Jesus says, wait a minute, you're, you're Israel's teacher, right? And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And then it says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man, talking about Jesus. And he says this, Jesus ends here. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life. So this is what we're looking at together today. And as I mentioned to you, I think it's a very important and very helpful story for us because in it, I think we see reflected and represented for us the essence of the message Jesus gave us to give to the world. So based on what we see here and what we just read together there, what, what is the message then? If it reflects it for us, what is the message that Jesus gave us to give to the world that we see reflected in this story? There's a lot of ways we could define this, a lot of ways we could articulate this together, but here's how I wanna do this with you today. I want to point out for you that based on the conversation that we see here with Jesus and Nicodemus, the message that Jesus gave us to give to the world is essentially this, that Jesus offers us a whole new way of life and a whole new way to life. Now let me explain that first part there, the idea of a whole new way of life and what we mean there by that. And to understand that, I think we need to understand a little bit more about Nicodemus and what they're talking about here together. And, and to give you a little bit of background on Nicodemus, I want to point out for you, first of all, that Nicodemus was a guy who had a lot of good things going for him. He had a lot of stuff pulled together, a lot of things figured out. I mean, he was doing well in a lot of the areas that people often set out to do well in. And just to give you an example, of a few of those things, first of all, we see that Nicodemus was very religious. 
As we said, he was a Pharisee. I mean, he was as religious as it gets. He checked all the boxes, did all the things that a good religious person was supposed to do. Not only that, we see that he was deeply respected. We said that he was part of the Jewish ruling council. He was considered to be Israel's teacher. I mean, vocationally for what this guy did for a living, I mean, he had made it. He had climbed the ladder. He was deeply respected and very successful. Not only that, many scholars point out they believe that Nicodemus was probably quite rich and affluent. We read later on in his story and later on in Jesus' story that when Jesus died on the cross, there were some guys that came to prepare his body to be buried, and Nicodemus was one of them. And when Nicodemus came to help with that, he brought some expensive myrrh and aloes to help prepare Jesus' body for burial. Many people believe that he was quite affluent and probably quite rich. Again, in many ways, he was doing well. He was succeeding at the, so many of the things that so many people try to succeed at at times. It's ironic. Actually, his name, Nicodemus, means conqueror or winner. And this is what Nicodemus was. I mean, he was a winner. He was winning at life. He's winning in all these different areas, doing the things that everybody else was setting out to do. And yet, even though that was the case, as we look at this dialogue here, one of the things that we discover is that even though he was very religious and deeply respected and likely quite rich, he was also still very unresolved, wasn't he? There was still something missing for Nicodemus. There was still something that he knew that he needed that he couldn't quite put his finger on. There was still something that he knew that his heart was longing for, that no amount of religious activity and no amount of vocational success and and no amount of material affluence would be able to provide for him. And he had all those things, and yet still something was missing. Maybe like a lot of us who are killing it in some of these areas, and yet you find yourself still perhaps a little unresolved. Jesus knew this was the case for Nicodemus. And so he dives right in, he gets right to the heart of it, and he addresses the thing that Nicodemus is missing, that Jesus knew he would never be fulfilled without or apart from. And what was that? Well, for Nicodemus, essentially, it was a whole new way of life that only Jesus could give. Jesus described this with words that I just read for you, like kingdom of God and eternal life. And I don't know what you think about when you hear those phrases. Maybe they're just confusing to you. Maybe you've been in church long enough that uh, when you hear those words, you somewhat mistakenly assume that that only refers to what happens to you when you die, that those are just references to heaven, where you go if you belong to Jesus when you die. And, and yet what I want to point out for you today is that while that's an important part of the process of what Jesus came to do and what Jesus is doing, I mean, we can't experience the rest of it without experiencing that. It doesn't even come close to reflecting all that Jesus is referring to here with this. You see, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and he talks about eternal life, he's talking about a whole new way of life that actually it carries on into eternity, but it begins here and now. In fact, it's actually the way of life we were created for in the beginning, that we were always supposed to live. We were always supposed to live as part of the kingdom of God. We were always supposed to live this eternal life, a kind of life that goes on into eternity. But the problem is that we find in the beginning of our story as human beings is that we rejected God and rebelled against God. And because of that, we've been missing out on this way of life ever since. And Jesus came to restore us back to that. Again, this is what he's talking about when he says kingdom of God and eternal life. Uh, Just to give you some kind of extra explanation here on what that looks like and what that's all about and what Jesus is offering us, I want to list for you a few characteristics that are part of this whole new way of life that Jesus offers to us. We see a few of those things up here on the screen. First of all, it's a way of life in which we experience the age to come in the present age. As I said, Jesus came to fix what our sin was broken, the kind of life we were made for in the beginning but that our sin against God, our rejection of God, our rebellion toward God has caused us to miss out on is the kind of life that Jesus is trying to lead us back into. Again, it's the life of the age to come where all of this is heading, where we're gonna end up again if you belong to Jesus, but we begin to experience and we enter into it in the here and now. It's the age to come in the present age. It's also a way of life in which Jesus is king and we're his people. The idea of the kingdom of God is the idea that we no longer live as the king of our own lives. We no longer call the shots. We let Jesus do that. We let him have authority. We let him have leadership in our lives that we make sure to live our lives in a way that his way of things becomes the way of things for us. It's a way of life in which we're with God and for each other rather than rebelling against God and rejecting him and turning our backs toward him. We're with God. We're reconciled to God again the way that we were always supposed to be living our lives. And not only that, we're not just for ourselves, but we live for each other. Not selfishly as though everybody else exists to get 
what we want to have happen in our lives, but instead we exist for each other to serve one another, to live selfishly, selflessly and sacrificially for the good of others around us. It's a way of life in which we're forgiven of sin and free of its power. And I don't know about you, but every time I just say those words, as I taught this last night, and just saying it again with you here today, every time I just say these words, forgiven of sin and free of its power, man, there's just something refreshing in that, isn't there? That the, we don't have to continue to live in the guilt and shame and embarrassment of the decisions that we've made. We can be forgiven of those things. We don't have to live continuing to be slaves to the things that devastate and destroy us, but we can be free of its power in our lives. This is part of the way of life that Jesus offers to us. And not only that, it's a way of life in which we experience becoming like, not just looking like. And what I mean by that is that for Nicodemus and for many others like them, they knew something was missing. They were chasing after whatever that was in every way they knew how, through all sorts of different things and a lot of different religious things that they were trying to do. But the problem was, all it was doing was changing the way that they looked on the outside. The appearances that they gave, the perceptions that they developed with other people, and yet it never really addressed or changed who they were on the inside. And this whole new way of life that Jesus offers to us is one in which we experience actually becoming something different from the inside out, not just looking like something different on the outside with what people see. This is just a snapshot. I mean, we could spend, it kind of pains me to keep it this brief here with this. We could spend series upon series just talking about the kingdom of God and eternal life and what Jesus offers to us with this. But, but again, suffice it to say with this here, this is the whole new way of life that Jesus offers to us that Nicodemus was looking for and longing for but couldn't quite put his finger on, that no amount of religious activity or vocational success or material affluence would provide for him, but only Jesus could offer it to him. And it's the same for all of us. It's a whole new way of life characterized by these things, the kingdom of God and eternal life, the age to come and the present age. This is what he offers us. It's such a significant part of the message that Jesus has given us to give to the world. So how do we experience it? How do we enter into that? How do we kind of embrace this whole new way of life? Well, that's the second part of the message that I just told you about a moment ago. Not only does Jesus offer us a whole new way of life, but also a whole new way to life, right? So let me talk about this. What do we mean by this? Jesus introduces this to us through words that we read there in the story earlier with words like being born again. Or we could also translate that as born from above or being born in the spirit. And obviously, maybe that raises some questions for some of us. We're like, what are you talking about here, Jesus? Certainly raised questions for Nicodemus. As we read in the story, Nicodemus went right to the literal, physical idea of that, right? And he said, I, hold on, Jesus. I'm a little bit confused. What are you trying to say here? I mean, are you talking about somebody literally climbing back into his mother's womb and literally physically being born again? I mean, who can do that, Jesus? And not only that, if we're honest, let's just address the elephant in the room. Who would want to do that, Jesus, right? (laughs) I mean, even if you could figure out how to make that work, you're going to disqualify a lot of people that are just going to give up and walk away if that's what you're talking about, Jesus. And of course, Jesus wasn't talking about a literal, physical climbing back into the womb and being born again, but a spiritual birth that Jesus was pointing us to here. And uh, as I thought about that and this idea of being born again and what Jesus is pointing out and what he talks about with Nicodemus, I think there's a couple things that are required of us that are a part of, if we want to experience the whole new way of life that Jesus gives us, and we have to kind of embrace this whole new way to life as well. And there's a couple things that I think he points us to here with this that are required of us in order to enter into this life that we can't be satisfied with that. One of the first things is this that I want to point out for you, that to be born again, to be born from above, to be born of the Spirit, to enter into this new way of life that Jesus gives us. One of the things that we have to do is this. We have to choose to trust him rather than try hard. This was a radically new way of looking at things for Nicodemus. As I mentioned to you earlier, his whole world revolved around figuring out which rules do I need to keep and trying as hard as he possibly could to keep them. That's how he thought he would find what he was looking for. That's how he thought he would live the life that he was longing to live. That's how he thought he would be reconciled with God and be in God's good graces and experience God's blessing in his life by trying really hard to keep all the rules that he thought he was supposed to keep. And Jesus confronts that with Nicodemus and he says, it doesn't work that way. He offers a whole new, not only a whole new way of life, but a whole new way 
to life, one in which it wouldn't be dependent on what we do, but rather would be dependent on what Jesus has done. And he points us to this in a couple ways. Again, first, just the language, the idea of being born again or born from above or born of the spirit. I think those words themselves imply that whatever it is that we need to do, whatever it is that we need to experience, it's gonna come from somewhere outside of ourselves. It's not gonna be something we manufacture and manipulate for ourselves, but something that somebody else, God's own son and God's own spirit actually does and accomplishes for us. Jesus not only points us to that, though, through those words, he points us to that even through one of the examples that he gives, a story that he references here, the story of a man that we read about in the Old Testament of the Bible, in the early parts of the Bible, a guy by the name of Moses, and a group of people that he was leading at the time that we know as the Israelite people. And in the Old Testament, the Israelite people, in Numbers chapter 21, the book of Numbers 21, there we read this story, we find that the the Israelite people in the Old Testament of the Bible, they were God's people. They were, in, in a lot of the ways, like the church, they were given the task of showing people in the world what God was like and what it looks like to be his people. And sometimes they were okay at that, and most of the time they weren't very good at it at all. And on this story, it wasn't one of their bright, shining moments. They were starting to get impatient. They were starting to gripe. They were getting, they were complaining against God and kind of arguing amongst each other. They didn't like what God was doing and where he was leading them and how he was getting them there. And so they start to complain against God and God has to teach them again that it's foolish to turn their back against him. They were beginning to reject him and rebel against him again. And so like a good heavenly father, he comes in and he tries to teach them that that it's foolish to do that. And the way that God does this is this, like every good father with unruly kids, he sends in the snakes. And he, uh, I've never tried that actually, but uh, it says that he allowed some venomous snakes to come into their camp. With our kids, we call this learning things the hard way, right? And they come into the camp, and as you can imagine, as these venomous snakes come into the camp, they begin to bite people, and as people are bitten, they begin to get sick. Eventually, some of them begin to die, and as they begin to die, they begin to cry, and as they cry, they cry out to God, and they cry out to Moses, and God says to Moses, all right, here's the deal. If if they want to be healed, here's what you need to do. He says, I want you to, to make a snake out of bronze, some kind of image of the snakes that are there in your camp, and I want you to put this bronze snake up on a pole and anybody that's been bitten and is infected with this venom, all they have to do is they have to turn to this bronze snake and look at it and they'll be healed. It's kind of a weird story, really. And yet what I wanna point out to you is this, that Jesus was helping us see in his conversation with Nicodemus that all along that story way back then was meant to point them and to point all of us eventually to Jesus and who who he was and what he would be doing for all of us. You see, like the Israelite people thousands of years ago, all of us have been bitten, so to speak, by the venomous snake of what we call sin. And just like with them, it's caused all sorts of damage and suffering and even death in our lives, not just physical death, but spiritual death and relationship death and emotional death and all kinds of different ways. And And yet it's tempting for us to do exactly what the people of Israel, I'm sure, did back in that story to when you're infected with this, to run around doing whatever you can to try to find some kind of remedy that will fix what's broken, that will provide a cure, that will heal you. And what I think Jesus was doing in applying the story to himself was pointing us to that and saying to us that in the same way for them, it works the same way for us, that the only remedy that we're gonna find for this won't be found in something we do for ourselves, but it will only be found in putting, turning to and putting our trust in the remedy that God provides for us. You see, what saved the people that day wasn't that bronze snake, but it was the, their turning and trusting and calling out to God again and saying, God, we've turned our backs on you, but we need you. We're trusting you, we need you to heal us, and only you can. And in the same way, Jesus says to all of us through this, that rather than trying hard and trying and trying and trying, we need to choose turning and trusting to look to him. He was the one who took on our sin. He became like the snake for us. And he wasn't lifted up on a pole, but he was lifted up on the cross. And he says to us, any of us who will turn and look and put our trust in him, well, then we can be forgiven and healed and made new as well. You see, it wouldn't come from trying and trying, but from turning and trusting. It's a whole new way to life that Jesus offers to us. It was a radically new way for Nicodemus and many other people like him. You see every other religion in their day and in ours as well, every other religious effort 
was dependent on what we do for ourselves. And only Jesus offers us a way that's dependent on what he's done for us. When I thought about this, I was reminded of a great illustration I read here over the course of the summer. I've been reading a book called Everybody Always by Bob Goff. Some of you maybe have read that. If you haven't, I highly recommend it, but I thoroughly enjoyed reading it this summer. And in it, he gives an illustration I think illustrates this point really well. He talks in a story about this idea of collecting tickets. And how many of you have ever taken your kids before to a place like Chuck E. Cheese or something like that, right? And you run around for a little while. You go in there, you do the obligatory, spend way too much money buying some tokens they're going to burn through in about five minutes. And, uh, and then you watch them run around like crazy and work really hard to collect what? To collect tickets, right? If they win these games and they do well at these different things that they try to do, they can earn tickets. And uh, every once in a while, not only will they collect tickets, sometimes they'll, they'll get the jackpot of tickets. This is a picture of our son, Eli, just the other day who did this. I mean, he thought he had made it. He did the little claw game and pulled out a whole like roll of tickets. I mean, he thought he had hit the jackpot. And if you've ever been there before as a parent, you know it's a little bit kind of discouraging, disheartening for you as a parent because you watch your kids run around doing this and you know that even though they're running around and they're collecting all these tickets and they're excited because they think in the end they're going to be able to trade it in for something fun, you know that when that time comes, they're going to go to the counter and give them however many tickets they have and all they're going to get in return is mostly junk, mostly garbage, right? And again, as a parent, it almost just kind of pains you to watch this because as they run around doing this, you know, you're like, well, I know this, getting all those tickets makes you feel like you're actually doing and accomplishing something great and going to be able to trade it in the, in the end for something you really want. But the reality is you really actually aren't, right? And it's the same thing with us when it comes to this whole idea of trusting him rather than trying hard. I think Jesus was looking at Nicodemus and looks perhaps at many of us and says, stop collecting tickets, whether it's through religion and all sorts of things you're doing with that or or other things in your life, your success, your career, your possessions, whatever it is that you're chasing after and trying hard with to try to experience this way of life that your heart longs for that you can't be satisfied without, you're not going to find it in that. If you want this whole new way of life that Jesus offers to us, you also have to embrace this whole new way of life to life that he offers us as well, one in which we choose to trust him rather than to just try hard. I think this is a decision we all have to make, not only once, but we keep on making, continuing to trust him rather than try hard. It's one of the things that I think is part of what Jesus points us to here, and it's part of being born. Again, a second thing that I want to point out for you then is this, not only do we need to choose to trust him rather than try hard, we also need to choose to leave the old in order to live the new. And here's what I mean by that. When you think about the words themselves, just the idea of being born again, I think those words themselves imply that whatever it is that you were born into before has come to an end. In other words, to start something new, you had to what? You had to stop whatever was old, right? This is such a big deal. It's such an important part of the message Jesus has given us to give to the world. And yet I think this is such an easy one for us to miss because this is where the good news that Jesus gives to us is also challenging news. You see, I think it's easier for us at times to kind of embrace that idea that it's by trusting him rather than trying hard. There's some relief in that, right? You kind of exhale and you catch your breath and you're like, oh, yes, that feels good. But this is a little bit tougher pill for us to swallow. It's a little bit more difficult for us to trust him enough to actually choose to leave our old way of life in order to live this new way of life in him. And yet it's so important. Jesus says you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't enter the kingdom of God. You can't experience eternal life unless you are born again. And I don't think you can be born again unless whatever it is you were born into before has come to an end. You have to leave the old to live the new. This is a challenge for many of us. I think what I've seen in my own life at times, and perhaps for many of you as well, is that sometimes, again, this is a little bit more difficult for us to embrace. And so sometimes what we do is we actually try to kind of live both lives, right? And we twist this whole idea that I just shared with you there. And instead of choosing to leave the old in order to live the new, we kind of twist it slightly. And we try to kind of live the old and live the new at the same time, which never really works. And I think part of the message Jesus gave us to give to the world is that Not only are we offered a whole new way of life, but a whole new way to life. And part of the way to life that Jesus offers to us requires us to leave the old in order to live the new. You see, you can't 
begin to live as one who's made Jesus king of your life until you've chosen to stop living as though you're the king of your life. You can't begin to live as a, as a, a friend of God until you choose to stop living as an enemy of God. You can't live as one who's free from the power of sin in your life, the things that destroy you, until you choose to stop living as a slave to those things. You can't start living in the light until you choose to stop living in the darkness. You can't start living in God's truth until you choose to stop living in the enemy's lies and deception. You have to leave the old to live the new. The old perceptions and priorities and preferences and patterns of your life in order to experience and embrace the whole new way of life that Jesus offers to us. This is all part of the message Jesus gave us to give to the world. He offers a whole new way of life and a whole new way to life. We see it reflected in this dialogue with him and Nicodemus, but I think we also see it captured so well in the very next verse in John chapter three. And actually, I think this is somewhat of John, the guy that wrote this down for us after, after recording the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. I think in some ways he kind of summarizes it for us in one of the most famous and well-known Bible verses in all the Bible in John chapter three, verse 16. And some of you know the verse. If you don't, let me read this for you. Here's what John says as he kind of captures the whole conversation right here. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He sent his son Jesus to move into the neighborhood with a message. And the message was this, that whoever believes in him, whoever puts their trust in him, whoever embraces this whole new way to life that Jesus gives, whoever chooses to trust him and not just try hard, and whoever believes and trusts him in, in him enough to leave the old in order to live the new, whoever does that will not continue to perish and experience death in all of its different ways and fashions, but instead will experience and enter into a whole new way of life, a way of eternal life with him in this life and in the life to come. This is the message that Jesus gave us to give to the world. And here's what I think we need to do with this. For all of us here, we hear this today, we understand this together. As we come to terms with this, as we understand this, what we need to do with this are a couple of things. First of all, I think that we need to receive this message for ourselves, but then also choose to reflect this message to others. You see, Jesus gave us this message to give to the world. And here's one thing I know, you can't give what you don't have. And so where we have to begin is that we all need to receive this message ourselves and then we need to choose to reflect this to others. Some of you are here today and you've never received this message. You've never received the life, the whole new way of life that Jesus offers us. You've never received that for yourself. And maybe you didn't know about it. Maybe you never heard about it. Maybe you were confused by it. You weren't sure exactly what it was or what it meant. Maybe you just simply didn't care. But my hope and prayer for you today is that you would see and believe and come to know and understand that Jesus and only Jesus came into the world 2,000 years ago to offer you a whole new way of life, a way of life that I think you can't be satisfied without, that your heart longs for. It's the way of the kingdom of God. It's the way of life, of eternal life. It's a way in which you're reconciled with God, in which Jesus is king, in which you live not only for yourself, but for others, in which you're forgiven of sin and free of its power, in which you actually become like Jesus and not just make efforts on the outside to look like a better version of you. There's a whole new way of life that Jesus offers to you, but it can only be entered into and found and experienced when you make the decision to trust him rather than try hard. And you make the decision to leave the old in order to live the new. I think it's a decision you make once to begin, but it's a decision we all keep on making as we continue to walk with him. And if you've never made that decision to receive that for yourself today, then I want to just challenge you to make that decision today. Brothers of us, we're here and we know this, we understand it. Maybe we believe it. We know this message Jesus gave us to give to the world. And if you're sitting here today, you're like, yep, I know all this, got it, got it down. And here's my question for all of you. What are you waiting for? Let's share it with the world. It's not enough for us just to receive it ourselves, but we're commissioned and sent out to, to reflect it to the world around us. You can no longer say, I don't know what the message is. We've talked about it together. In fact, just to make sure you know what it is, let's, let me, let's say it together. Would you repeat this after me? Repeat these words after me. Jesus offers, Jesus offers. a whole new way of life 
and a whole new way to life. You got it. This is it. Let's reflect it to the world around us. Let's share it with passion. Let's not show up like Chris Farley wanting to say something and feeling like we should say something but not knowing what to say. Let's show up in the world with passion and boldness and conviction and confidence in the message Jesus has given us to give to the world. I wanna pray in just a moment and give those of us who've never received this for ourselves a chance to do that, but also for those of us who've done that, a chance to commit ourselves to, uh, to share this with the world around us as well. So if you would, let's pray together. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and let me pray for us and give us a chance to respond in that way. Let me begin, first of all, for those of you who are here today, and maybe you heard this, maybe you never heard it before. Again, maybe for the first time it was clear to you. Maybe you just really realize you're never gonna be satisfied until you do something with this. And so you're here and you want to receive this whole new way of life that Jesus and only Jesus offers to you. And if that's you this morning, here's what I wanna do. I wanna pray with you, but here's how I wanna begin with that. I want you just in the quietness of your own heart in a conversation just between you and Jesus for a moment. I want you just to say these words to Jesus in your heart to him. I want you to say, Jesus, that's me. And then I want you to pray these words with me. Jesus, I believe you offer a whole new way of life, a way that I was made for, that my heart longs for, that I'll never be satisfied without. It's a way in which I live with you as king, a way in which I live with forgiveness of my sin, a way in which I live with the opportunity to be free of its power in our lives, a way in which I actually become more like you, not just look like something different on the outside. Today, Jesus, I want to receive that whole new way of life in you. And so rather than trying hard, trying to do things to earn something I can't earn for myself, like the Israelites thousands of years ago, Jesus, I turn and I look, and I want you to know that I've put all my trust in you and in what you did for us. And Jesus, I trust you so much that I'm willing to leave the old in order to live the new. For others of you, you're here, and as I said, maybe you've received this yourself before, but maybe you're not as involved as Jesus invites us to be in sharing it with others. And so I wanna pray for you and give us a chance to commit ourselves to that as well. And if that's you, just like we did with that first group there, I want you just to begin by in your heart to Jesus, just saying, Jesus, that's me. And pray along with me these words in your heart to him. Jesus, we believe that you've given us a message to give to the world. That it's not just for ourselves to receive and to embrace and to enjoy and to experience, but you've entrusted it to us. You've challenged, you've commissioned us to share it with the world. Lord, we know what it is. We believe it with our hearts. We put our trust in you. We believe there's a whole new way of life and a whole new way to life. And just as we would never be satisfied apart from that, we believe there's a whole world of people that never will be either. So Jesus, would you use me? Would you use us this coming week even with our spouses, with our roommates, with our kids, with our classmates, our coworkers, our friends, whoever it might be, Jesus, help us to reflect this message that you've given to us to give to the world. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your love for us. We continue to worship and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Listen, before we leave, we've got a couple things we're going to do together. One of the things I want to do is point you to a couple ways that we as the church demonstrate that we've made these decisions that we just talked about and prayed about together. And one of them is for those of you who've received this life that Jesus has given to you, you've received this message he's given us to give to the world, you've made it your own, you've embraced it for yourself. One of the ways that you make that personal and private decision public is through something we call baptism. And if you're unfamiliar with baptism, let me explain it for you. When someone is baptized, they go into the water and one of us as pastors will dip them back down into the water. And of course, depending on how rotten they are, we keep them under a little extra, but uh, we, we don't leave them under there forever. We bring them back up out of the water. And there's something symbolic in that. Jesus actually modeled that. He gave that to us as a way of being able to say a couple things that when we dip back down into the water, we're first of all saying that we've put our trust, we're no longer trying hard, we put our trust in Jesus' death that he died on the cross 
and that he also rose again from the dead. We've embraced a whole new way to life that can only be found in him. But not only that, when we lay back down in the water and come back out again, we're also saying that we trust Jesus enough that we've made a decision to leave our old way of life, to die to the old way of things in order to live a new life with him. If you've never taken that step, I want you to know in two weeks, we have our outdoor baptism service. Brian mentioned it earlier. I want you to step into that. There's not, a, there's not gonna be a better time for you than in two weeks to come out and to be a part of that with dozens of others who have made that decision, who have received this for themselves and it's a way that you demonstrate it for everyone else. So I wanna encourage you to be a part of that. Again, you can sign up online or with our app or with one of the cards on your seat. You can drop it at guest services, but I wanna encourage you to be a part of that. Another way that we demonstrate that we've made these decisions that we talked about and prayed about together through something we're gonna do during our last few minutes here together, it's something we call communion. And this is something that Jesus actually gave to us, that he modeled for us. He introduced to us 2,000 years ago as he got ready the night that he was betrayed on his way to be hung on the cross and to die in our place and to rise again from the dead. Prior to all of that, he gathered with some of his closest friends and followers, his earliest disciples, and he shared a meal with them there. And in the midst of that meal, Jesus took some bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, guys, this bread is my body that's being given for you. And when you eat this in this way, I want you to eat this in remembrance of me. And then he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant that's being established in my blood. That's being shed on the cross for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. Whenever you drink this in this way, I want you to drink this in remembrance of me. And so they did then, and we've continued to do that all the way down to today. And we're going to do that over the next few minutes. And as we eat and drink together, what I want to point out for you is that when we eat the bread and we drink the cup, We're proclaiming again our belief, our confidence that Jesus offers a whole new way of life and a whole new way to life. We're proclaiming again that rather than trying hard, we put our trust in him and his death and his resurrection for us. And we're also proclaiming that we too have died to our old way of things. We've left the old in order to live the new. And I think as we eat and drink, we're also saying to Jesus, Jesus, in the same way that you were broken and poured out, to bring this message of hope and healing to a broken world in the same way as we eat and drink, we're saying to Jesus, Jesus, we wanna be broken and poured out as well. We wanna give our lives to bringing this message of hope and healing to the world that so desperately needs it as well. So we're gonna take a moment to do that now together. Our team's gonna pass some trays down the rows and give us a chance to do this. And uh, as those trays come by, if you're a follower of Jesus here today, we're gonna invite you to participate. And you'll notice there are are stacks of cups. You want to grab the whole stack. In the bottom cup, there's a piece of bread. In the top cup, there's some juice. And we want to encourage you to take that. And as our team leads us in this song, we're going to take a moment to reflect, to spend time with Jesus, to commit ourselves to him, to recommit ourselves to him, and to commit ourselves to sharing the message with the world that he's given to us to give to the world. And uh, we usually have you wait, and we do this together. We're just going to encourage you to go ahead and take that whenever you're ready. You can eat and drink on your own during this song as they play this. So let's take a few minutes and do that together, and I'll come and close us in a few minutes.
Who's able to forgive? Only Jesus. Who is our righteousness? Only Jesus. Who opens up our eyes? Only Jesus. pray for us. Jesus, we worship you. We adore you. We continue to proclaim those words, Jesus. Only Jesus. You're the only one who came to rescue us. You're the only one who could rescue us. And we thank you, Jesus, for doing what you did. We thank you for the message you've given us to give to the world. Help us to be people that live in such a way that we demonstrate that we have received that ourselves, but also who live in such a way that show that we're passionate about reflecting it to others in the world around us who are dying to hear it, Jesus. Go with us this week, Lord, and we pray that you would empower us in every way to be your people. By your grace, 
and for your glory in your strong and awesome name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Guys, thanks for being here today. And if you'd like someone to pray with you afterward, we want to invite you up front. We'd love to be able to do that with you for the rest of you. We hope you have a great rest of the day and a great week. We'll see you later.